Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those of you who are joining us from the other side of the world, from wherever you are looking at the other side of the world. On behalf of ADAS International, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to a second event of our ADAS International Summer Summit Health Talks with ADASA experts. We are privileged today to have with us a very busy person, one of the top three busiest persons among ADASA leaders at ADASA Medical Organization. We have with us Dr. Tamar Ram, the head director of the ADASA Mount Scopus Hospital, uh, gynecologist by profession, the background, and uh, having studied in Harvard, uh, preparing for running ADASA Mount Scopus. And uh, she's a visionary, she's an example, she is an inspiration to all of us. And Tamar uh, has taken a very challenging responsibility over the last few months. We think that the uh, big responsibility is to managing a hospital where you have COVID-19 patients. I think, you know, I, I wouldn't say the bigger challenge, but I think as big as running a COVID-19 hospital, is to manage in a country like Israel, in a city like Jerusalem, to manage a COVID-19 free hospital. Uh, and we want to hear about that experience because, you know, when we started planning this event, and a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about uh, how to look at this post-COVID-19 era. And a, a week later, we were already talking, okay, how we are going to talk about uh, managing a hospital living with COVID-19. And it looks like, as we look at the numbers today in Israel and the last couple of days increasing, and other parts of the world talking about the second wave, it looks like how it, what it means managing a hospital when we look at the second wave of COVID-19. Tamara Ram, Dr. Tamara Ram, our friend, my friend, incredible leader of ADASA, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Jorge. First of all, it's a pleasure for me to see so many familiar, familiar faces of uh, friends and people that I know around the, from around the world smiling at me from the screens. I'm actually quite excited. It's so difficult to hold international events nowadays. So this is a real pleasure for me and thank you again. Um, I think Perhaps I should relate to what you mentioned, Jorge, about a COVID-free hospital by first of all asking ourselves why. Why does Hadassah want to have a COVID-free hospital? And the answer is that since, since we believe, we probably all believe, but definitely Hadassah believes that COVID-19 isn't the only disease that any of us can suffer from, then it's Hadassah's duty to keep on giving medical services to the 1.2 million population of Greater Jerusalem. And really, at, perhaps at day one, when we realized this was going to, COVID-19 was going to be a very big event, Professor Watstein, together with the whole leadership of Hadassah, made what in my eyes is a very great decision and decided that only one of the, one of the campuses in Kerem would have COVID-19 departments. And I think as a leader, it's not always very easy to understand what's meant from us. And one of our maybe most complex, uh, um, uh, one of the most complex things we have to deal with is, is to try to interpret um, instructions that we get. So really the only instruction I ever got was keep your hospital, keep Mount Scopus COVID free. And from then on, everything had to happen according to what um, we decided. Um, Perhaps, Jorge, if you want to ask me some specific questions about the whole, um, yeah. about yeah, the procedures, or if you, if you want me just yeah, to keep I on speaking. You, you, can keep, you can keep talking, you know. I think what, uh, what one, one of the main questions, and, and I will be interrupting you to ask, as a good Israeli, to, to, uh, to make it this more, more dynamic. Uh, and everybody is welcome to uh, write your questions on the chat, and uh, I'll be picking up some of the questions or most of the questions. Um, I think uh, that in practice, what, what did it mean in practice? Really in practice, okay. 
uh, to run a hospital that we declare is COVID free. So like non-COVID patients that we don't know who are patients or not COVID-19 positive, and we don't know if they are positive, would arrive to the gates of, of Mount Scopus and say, I'm coming uh, to the emergency. And uh, because, you know, I'm not feeling well. And, you know, what, what did it mean in practice and how did you build the protocols and the system to make that happen? Exactly. So you just addressed the main challenges, which are how do we know? What does it mean to be COVID free? And how do we know who has COVID and who doesn't? So I could, um, I could um, define it on a few levels. The first level is who comes into the hospital? And this is a question that I think hospitals around the world ask themselves, uh, who are the patients coming into the hospital? Who do we suspect has COVID? How do we decide that we suspect somebody has COVID? And do we allow visitors to come in? How many visitors? If a woman's coming in to give birth, uh, do we allow her spouse to come? Do we allow her mother to come? Do we not? And, and allow me to give some examples from our everyday life at Mount Scopus. So I'll give you an example. I'm sure you know that in Israel and also around the world, probably the largest, one of the largest tragedies of COVID was the elderly um, and fragile population were hurt so badly, right? So you probably all know that at, at Mount Scopus, we have the only rehabilitation and geriatric rehabilitation department in Jerusalem. So I found myself having to tell relatives, close relatives of patients, of geriatric patients of rehabilitation, no, you cannot come and visit your parents. That's a very difficult decision and having to face these people and, and say, you know, I know how, it, how important it is for your father, your mother, your spouse, your child to have you by their sides when they're sick. But unfortunately, we cannot allow you into the hospital because we're endangering everybody else. So that's an example of, uh, uh, of who do we at all do we allow into the hospital. Now, the second stage is what happens at the ER in the emergency room. Once a patient enters the hospital, now there are two options. The patient generally is either suspect to be suffering from COVID-19. You know, we developed all kinds of sophisticated questionnaires. It began with, have you recently returned from another country? Very quickly, no one had recently returned from another country. And then it became, have you been suffering from a fever or from a cough or, or similar symptoms? But then very quickly we realized that it's not only respiratory symptoms that the patients suffer from, and then it developed to have you been in contact with someone who's suspected and so on. So, Really, I think this is was always was all is very very dynamic, and perhaps I could say that leading in time of COVID nineteen is a big test for leadership. Really, leadership. Tell us about that. Yes, tell us about that. That's what it is. Leadership. When is leadership tested? Leadership is tested in times of uncertainty, right? And probably maybe we'll speak later about uh, opportunities from this situation and I think right. maybe I can already say now that one of the, la the, one of the uh, greatest opportunities of this time is getting the chance to identify who your real leaders really are. Who are the people you can trust? Not only in routine, calm days when we're doing it, what we're used to always doing, but who are the people who can think out of the box, who don't, get, uh, uh, who don't lose their minds in times of crisis, who can teamwork even when they're under pressure. This is one of the opportunities and I was quite surprised in both directions. Some people whom I was positively surprised and others whom I realized there's only a limit how much I can trust them. Back to the different levels of the hospital. So who enters the ER? I want to pay, so any patient who entered the ER and was even slightly suspicious for being COVID-19 patient. Now it could even be a patient who's, whose leg was broken but if it's a patient whose leg was broken, who replied to our questionnaire in such a way that we suspected they were a COVID-19 patient, all these patients entered the, what we call the respiratory emergency room. Now, to all of you who are familiar with Mount Scopus, and I hope it's many of you, you probably know that for the, over the last two years, we've been massively renovating the present campus, not to speak about planning the new campus. And one of the the biggest changes that is happening and has been happening over the last 18 months is that we're massively renovating our emergency room. So inside this emergency room, it's being renovated and we're about to move our pediatric emergency room and we're opening trauma rooms and we're having people building and electricians and everything and plumbers. Inside this, we also have to suddenly uh, dedicate 
about 40% of our emergency room to be a respiratory uh, uh, ER. Now, thankfully, well, I don't know if to say thankfully, you know, we really wish every, all uh, people of the world health, but um, thankfully, in all of the hospitals in Israel, and I would assume also around the, ro the world, the number of people who turn to the emergency room, not for COVID reasons, for any other reasons, during the three month COVID uh, emergency time, dropped by about 50%, which means 50% less people turn to the ER for reasons other than COVID. Now this was thankful because it allowed us to be more dynamic inside the ER and it allowed us to dedicate some of the area. It was less good for those people who turn to the RER and ERs uh, statewide and worldwide too late to be treated for whatever they're suffering from. For example, you know that last year, February 2019, we opened the new cath lab at Mount Scopus. And the cath lab at Mount Scopus uh, does close to 100 procedures a month. Unfortunately, during the three months of COVID, many more patients uh, arrived at the ER much later. And it was more difficult, and unfortunately, more lives lost because people came later to the ER. But back to our main subject. So, Part of the ER was dedicated to become a respiratory ER. And again, all suspected COVID patients went there. Now, you know, when I describe it now, it sounds te technically very simple. But really, this is not simple at all. Because anyone who's suspicious, from the minute they enter the hospital, they have to be treated as a suspicious patient who's also contagious, right? So everyone has to dress accordingly. And we have to, have to prepare the ER in such a way that anyone who entered the respiratory ER was totally protected so that they wouldn't catch it. And then if the staff had to walk from the respiratory ER to the regular ER, they had to change their clothes. So we had to adapt the whole way the ER was built to allow, allow for these procedures to help. So generally, we had two kinds of patients, those in the respiratory ER and those in the regular ER. Now, this all sounds very nice, but what happens if a patient comes in, not suspicious for COVID, for another reason, is lying in the regular ER, and then suddenly says, oh yeah, by the way, I had fever, or I've been coughing, or whatever, boom, and they become suspicious for COVID. So that's one situation that happened, at the beginning it happened more, but then we became more aware. And there's another situation, what happens if a patient comes into the ER, totally COVID, but, needs to, uh, but is in an emergency situation, someone who needs, for example, to be resuscitated, or a woman who's about to give birth. I don't have enough time. I have to treat her inside the hospital. I can't just leave her in the respiratory in the ER and say, you know, take care of yourself. Because theoretically, all patients who are in the respiratory ER were tested immediately for COVID. And anyone who was found positive was transferred to Adassa Second Campus at Ein Kerim. Adassa is very, very lucky to have two campuses in Jerusalem. So it allowed us to do this. Okay, this is the only hospital that has two campuses. So we were really spoiled from that point of view. And because we work, we totally, we work, we're part of one hospital, it was very easy for us just to participate, to get work in collaboration and transfer anyone who was COVID positive to Enkerem. Again, besides those people who needed to be treated for emergency situations and needed to be, to be treated inside um, Mount Scopus. We had, I think it's three people who came in and needed an emergency a cardiac catheterization and had to be treated according you know, to all the preventive procedures as contagious pa uh, um, patients. Thank God it seems that our measures worked and another very significant measure that took care of Hadassah personnel and Hadassah patients was that you probably know that very early, um, very early Professor Watchstein gave the order for all Hadassah personnel to be tested for COVID all personnel, asymptomatic. So we very quickly knew who were positive personnel and they could be isolated and sent home. Very few uh, staff, by the way. And we also very, very early on knew that if we made sure that our staff were wearing masks and dressing accordingly to prevent being catching the COVID-19, then we could protect them. And, we, and gradually we showed that really the, the staff who were behaving according to the instructions were protected and did not catch the COVID later on. So I think you know there is there is there is a point that you are making. 
And uh, Adassa, as you said, and for those uh, among the audience who don't know Adassa and haven't visited, you know, we have people in this, uh, in this event from 16 countries and uh, some people are first timers coming to hear and listen about Adassa. So Adassa in Jerusalem has two campuses built thanks to the generosity of uh, thousands of, of, of people um, uh, associated with uh, HWCA, the Adassa Women's Science Organization of America, Adassa International, and many other people all around the world. And uh, through many decades, they have uh, helped in building these two campuses that, uh, as you, uh, Tamar, mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a privilege, but I think it's, it's not a privilege. It's a result of, uh, of strategic planning and a decision to be ready for these kind of situations. Jerusalem is a city that for thousands of years has faced many situations, and now we don't have the exclusivity this time. It's not an exclusive for Jerusalem or for Israel. It's a pandemic that is hitting all over the world. And my question to you is, you know, many hospitals don't have the privilege of having two campuses, but they have the, uh, uh, the situation of having uh, different buildings, uh, different areas. And uh, what would be your advice for anybody running a hospital or planning hospital? They have, we have people here uh, from South America, for example, who are facing right now uh, a peak on the first wave of, uh, of uh, COVID-19 and, uh, and it's costing a lot of lives. And sometimes the small details that you mentioned of, uh, of how to organize the flow of people and to divide the areas uh, is critical for being able to save lives um, properly. So what would be your advice, in, even if you don't have the privilege of having two different locations in two different areas of one city, if it's in one, what would you recommend how to organize that from your experience? Okay, so I think the first piece of advice I would give is build yourself a team of people who you trust. Now in Israel, we're very experienced. Um, according to law, we have to keep on practicing being prepared for emergency situations where we either prepare for warfare or for infectious disease outbreaks or for chemical attacks and so forth. So we practice these things. Nothing is similar to reality, of course, but we are used to the concept of having to build around you a team of people, including experts, who are going to help you make decisions. Why? Because in, this, in these situations, you're going to find yourself, well, we found ourselves having to make many new difficult decisions in a short time that you've never been faced with before and there's a limit to a number of decisions that a person can make at a given moment and, to, and keep sane. So have around you a group of people who you can trust. So in this situation, for example, it, it was my uh, the leadership of the hospital and obviously uh, an experienced expert in infectious diseases who gave us all the information at that point. So that's my first part of, uh, part of advice. My second piece of advice is think about your building. Think about your campus. Try and answer the question of what would you do if you had to separate part of your campus for any given reason? And why am I bringing this as a piece of advice? Because despite the fact that up to now, all the COVID-19 inpatient departments are at Ein Kerem, I have been given the, um, or I have been asked to prepare for the situation to change because things are dynamic and we don't know what will be the maximal numbers and think different things are happening at Ein Kerem and we might reach a situation where we decide actually to shift the COVID-19 departments to Mount Scopus. So I have to prepare for this. And then we started asking ourselves questions like, so if we have one floor with two departments, for example, how are the patients going to, how are the staff and the patients going to be able to pass from one department to the other without crossing the corridors? Okay, it sounds like small things. And the answer is, at least in, 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 our, um, in our case, they can't. Okay, so we finally realized the only way we can dedicate a part of the hospital to COVID, if we have to, is to separate, theoretically, separate the two sides of the two wings of one building. And then we have elevators on both sides. But then you have to address questions such as, so are our oxygen systems separated or can they be separated? Okay, are the water systems separated? How do the staff walk in and out? Where do they change their clothes? 
Where do they undress? Where do they shower before they go home? They're not allowed to walk through the other part of the hospital. Where do the, patient, the COVID patients come in? Where do the ambulances drop them? So many questions. So if you prepare yourself ahead by just thinking about your campus and asking yourselves, if I had to separate part of this campus for COVID-19 or who knows what other infections are waiting for us down the road, what would I do? And the third piece of advice, the third piece of advice is don't stay in the hospital the whole time. You have to, you know, some people, as a leader, I'm not talking about, about the staff who are work, working, them too, but definitely as, as someone who's leading the hospital, you have to have the, the time when you leave the hospital and you go out, whether it's to your family or, or, or somewhere else to breathe a bit of fresh air, because once you leave the hospital and you come back, you see things differently. And every time when I left the hospital and I came back, I had new ideas and I had, and they were usually better ideas than the ones I had before because you mustn't fall in love with your ideas because in, in a few minutes later you might suddenly have again. So those are my three tips of advice to your question, Jorge. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I want to move from the more like uh, mundane and, you know, this kind of details that we are so essential for dealing with the pandemic to, to a more like a philosophical question um, of, of the things that you were mentioning before about leadership, you know, you, you, you mentioned the word leaders and leadership and, uh, and rising leaders. You, you spoke about trusting your leaders, empowering people, checking out who actually grows naturally as a leader, which I know one of the things that we, we've seen, you know, in periods of uncertainty and, and particularly in this time is that not necessarily formal leaders are the ones that raise up to the challenge. Sometimes it's just organic leaders. Somebody in your team that suddenly says, I'm ready to go, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the extra mile and and do other things um, and and I think you know you are you are definitely such kind of leader you know it's like uh, you inspire us not just with what you said but also with that ongoing smile in your face that communicates you know and it, I think in, in a position of leadership and management in times of uncertainty that kind of uh, attitude it's part of what we communicate and my question to you is can you talk a little bit more about your experience as a leader, uh, something that goes beyond issues of health and, and healthcare and medicine. You, this is, you are the front line, one way or another. You are at the front line of what is, you know, probably the, the, the battle of the century. Um, and, and in a way, this is, you know, even if it's a, a health emergency and a health-related crisis, it feels like we are on the front line. Everyone who is watching this uh, uh, even now, in one way or another, we are all on the front line. You know, we, we, we are in the, what we call it, Picuda Orif. You know, we are part of the, of, of the civil front line of this situation. And we have yeah. to be responsible and, and execute leadership one way or another. So what's your take on that? So, so thank you for asking that. And, and I'll share with you my philosophy on leadership. Um, I think probably the motto that leads me as a leader is be you. We probably are all familiar with people who, when they take upon themselves or receive leadership roles, they somewhat change. Now, it's not necessarily that people really change, but perhaps they believe that they have to bring out from them characteristic, characteristics which they believe will make them better leaders. Now, that's contrary to my belief, which says that if you're chosen to be a leader, you're chosen because of the traits you've shown before you became a leader. And if you change your traits and become someone different, then you're doing something wrong. And I have other roles in my life. I'm a mother of five. <laughs> I'm a wife. Um, I'm a gynecologist. Um, I'm, I write poetry. That's my real dream to become a poet. Um, and I lead a hospital and I practice being the same person in every one of these roles I fill. And, and I think in order to do this, everyone, specifically people who take upon themselves leaderships, that this is a tip for everyone, not only people who deal with leadership, you have to know, you have to choose the values upon which are your stepping stones. What do you believe in as a human being? What leads you? And whatever values that there are that you choose, they should be shared 
within all the roles you do in life. You know, I can give you many examples of decisions I've made, again, as a mother or as a director of a hospital, using exactly the same, uh, um, the same tools in order to make a decision. So I'll give you some examples of personal things. So I, a few years ago, I came across a book of uh, Jewish Musar. It's Jewish, well, it's not really Jewish philosophy. It's, Musar is like a, um, Jewish learning, Jewish soul learnings. Uh, perhaps I'd call it. And, and this book, it's actually an American book, which I came across by chance. One of the things that it, that it has, it has a list of, the, of, of Musar values, things which, you know, it's recommended that you read and you choose from, 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 from that list which, which of the values you connect to, which ones are important to you, and what, what things you want to practice in life. So I made myself a list. This was already a few years ago. And then when I came to be come director of the hospital, I went back to this list and I found that it was the same values that I believe in. And by the way, also the same things which I have to practice. I'll give you some examples. I won't leave you uh, in the air with this. Um, the same ones which led me in my other roles that lead me here. So for example, the value of humility. I believe very strongly that the greater the role you fill, the more humble you have to become. Because otherwise, you get mixed up and you start thinking, you know, how great I am, how amazing I am, and you know, and everything's thanks to me, when it's not really. There must be something, something larger than us are out there, whether you call it God or destiny or energy, whatever, it doesn't matter. And, and the more humble you become, the more capable you are of trust, putting your trust in other people too, and sharing your leadership with other people. So this is something that might sound obvious when I'm speaking about becoming a director of a hospital, but I actually started dealing with this in my mind when I was a young physician, because I remember very clearly I came back to work after being on maternity leave. I think it was after having my third kid, who's now 18. And, and the night I came back, I was then working as a resident on labor ward. The night I came back, there was a woman who, who had some uh, obstetric emergency, never mind the details, it's what's called cord prolapse, which means practically that the baby's head is blocking the oxygen by pressing on the cord. So I ran with this woman to a C, and we proceeded uh, on do, to do a C-section, and technically we saved the baby's life. And I remember the moment when I came out of that procedure and I stopped myself in the corridor and I said, so what does this mean? Does this mean, wow, I'm great? so lucky I came back from maternity leave today. What does this mean? Thank you for putting me in the place and in this situation, the right moment where I could help this baby and save its life. So I started dealing with this, this is close to 20 years ago, but I deal with these issues every day. So this is one value that, that I chose to bring with me and you know, contemplate on in my life. And, and I'll give an example of a value which, I've decided, which I know I have to practice, and that's the value of patience. Um, even though I often think that I'm a patient person, I'm not patient enough. And I often say to myself, you know, Tamar, you have to listen more. You have to wait. Not everything happens at once. Rome wasn't built in a day and so on. So if, so I'll, I'll get back to, to the original question. My belief that someone who wants to be a leader, who's a true leader, who is, really brings herself or himself into the leadership role, must know which are the values that lead you. And a practi my practical, most practical motto in the world of leadership is choose excellent people who will, be, who will work with you and under you. Because you can't, I cannot be a director of an organization where there are 1,200 workers and, and know exactly what each of them are doing every day. And my belief is that when you're a leader, especially a director of a hospital, I am responsible for everything that happens in my hospital at every given moment. Even now when I'm speaking to you, if something good is happening in the hospital, if something is going, go, is going wrong with the hospital, I'm in charge, I'm responsible. And I'll never be able to say, oh, you know, I wasn't there, you know, no. So in order for this to be able to happen and for me to really feel calm and to be able to speak to you without, you know, my head being elsewhere, I have to make sure, make sure I choose excellent heads of department, whether it's the nurses or the physicians or, or the administrative heads too, to make sure everything that happens in my hospital is safe and is good. You know, in, uh, in business uh, management, uh, they, one of the approaches uh, to crisis management that uh, I'd, uh, I prefer 
using uh, in my years of work with organizations is that approach that says that in periods of crisis, there are two things that you have to make sure you do. One is that you manage the crisis properly, that you take all the measures to contain the crisis, to manage, to make sure you get out of the crisis. But from day one that you identify you're in the middle of a crisis, you develop a vision for the future that you don't wait because unless you do that from day one, then you might end up with uh, a clean house at the end of the crisis, but with all the questions there of what to do next. Um, and uh, from the conversations I had with you and the work we do together, um, planning the future and, 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 and developing a, a vision for ADASA and for particular in your case for Mount Scopus, uh, I know that uh, you haven't stopped not only thinking, planning, <laughs> implementing uh, your vision for what uh, ADASA in Mount Scopus uh, the role that the, uh, Adasa and Scopus should play and how we should get there. So what's, uh, what's your vision beyond COVID-19 uh, for Adasa and Scopus as the director of Man Scopus? Yeah, so you're totally right. <laughs> and you know you're right because we spoke about this. I'm only asking Sorry? right questions. You are totally right. <laughs> Thank you for that excellent question. <laughs> Quite quickly, Inside the crisis, I asked myself, okay, what, how do I utilize this crisis in order to create, to make my vision from Mount Scopus, our vision from Mount Scopus happen even better and quicker than it would have happened if the crisis hadn't happened. Now, I could allow myself time and brain time to ask myself that question. First of all, because I had those excellent people who were dealing with the situation. And um, second of all, perhaps it is because I did not have the departments. So despite the fact I was dealing maybe with preventive medicine, right, with preventive COVID-19 and not with acute treatment of COVID-19, I had that time where I could stop things. So I did a few things. I, I asked each of my leadership personnel and heads of departments, what can you do better now thanks to COVID? The second thing is I made myself a list of the projects that are happening at Mount Scopus. And, and examine each of them, how I, can make, I, how I can make them happen better and quicker thanks to the COVID situation. And I'll give you some examples. But just one moment before I give you some examples, I'll describe a little bit about the vision of Mount Scopus. Because the campus at Mount Scopus, which is the original Hadassah campus, was built almost, it's already almost 100 years ago. It was opened actually in 1934. The campus was then um, abandoned between 1948 when the state of Israel was established and 1967 when the city of Jerusalem was united because it was unsafe to reach the campus. And then the campus underwent a short uh, um, a rehabilitation and was opened again in the early 70s. Meanwhile, in those years between 48 and 67, Hadassah opened the second campus at Enkeren, which in time became the, the larger campus. But since the early 1970s, the campus at Mount Scopus has hardly grown, very little, and any renovations that have taken place in the campus have been relatively minor renovations. So like I mentioned, that we've opened the cat lab, we've also opened the delivery rooms, and we're renovating our emergency room, but this is all happening inside the historical, beautiful, yet historical, old, and rundown campus of Mount Scopus. So we have a very, very beautiful vision and plan already that's already happening of actually rebuilding the whole new campus without pulling down the old historical building which is a historical and, and beautiful Zionist monument but on the grounds of Mount Scopus to rebuild a new modern campus. So this has actually already begun because I'm so happy that every day I come to work I see cranes at work because we're now building the new rehabilitation center for Jerusalem which is actually happening and that's the first building of the new campus. So I'll go back and give you some examples. So I looked at the emergency room, which is being renovated, and I said, well, well, now there's COVID happening. How can we do this better? So what I did was I made sure that all the workers who were working on these projects were tested for COVID, and I made sure they were COVID-free the whole time. So, and, and because, like I said before, 
the emergency room was really 50% less occupancy than, than, than usual because less people turned to the ER. So the parts were being renovated. They actually said, you know, well, if we were supposed to finish in November, we can actually finish in October because, um, because you're all COVID free and nobody's bothering you and there's less occupants in the ER, so please work harder. So that's one example. This example is, the, is a project that I'm doing, that I'm opening at Mount Scopus, which is um, cardiac rehabilitation. Patients who have undergone an acute uh, a cardiac event need to be rehabilitated afterwards. And we're opening a new center for that in Mount Scopus. Now, this was about to be uh, budgeted one moment before COVID, uh, COVID happened, COVID broke out. And, but there was still about a doubt about this really happening. Now, as COVID was happening, I realized, I understood, and I heard there were going to be all kinds of budget shifts. So I very quickly cut down the budget needs for this project to 50% of what I said we needed to begin with. And I said, you know, let's just start. And then practically we just started. And this could only happen because of the uncertainty and, and the COVID situation. So those two examples of how I allowed the vision of Mount Scopus to actually happen faster and uh, maybe even better in the long run, thanks to, thanks to the fact that we were under a COVID crisis. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think we, we, we probably might need to change the topic of, the, of this event because we call it, you know, leading a COVID-19 free hospital. I think it's leading a COVID-19 free hospital that is also growing all the time. Exactly. Um, and I think that's, that makes your story and the story of Juan Scopus in the last few months quite unique. You, you didn't stop uh, de developing the, the future infrastructure of the hospital. And I think, you know, that's probably a, a part of how we should be dealing uh, uh, with uncertainty. And particularly when uncertainty in this case also means not knowing when this thing is going to end. We don't know if the pandemic is something that will last another six months. We don't know if it might last another 18 months. And we don't know if we have to get used to live with this pandemic for a few years. You know, we hopefully will be in, in the first case. But uh, uh, on, the, on the other hand, the, the needs for healthcare are going to be even more. And, the, and, and, and our ability as a, as a hospital, in our case in Jerusalem and in Israel, to be able to deal with new situations, but at the same time with the ongoing health needs of our population are going to be increasing all the time. Um, when, we, when I look at the rehab center that, uh, that we are building at, uh, at Mount Scopus that we started building, that's a rehab center that, you know, when we started planning, we we're talking about the needs of, uh, of the residents of Jerusalem. Um, you know, if, if Mount Scopus will remain one of the few COVID-free hospitals in the country, that rehab center might need to accommodate definitely residents from the whole country that don't, won't have a, 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 a pandemic-free facility Definitely. in their cities and the needs yeah. are even greater. So having that vision, I think, you know, it's something, uh, something remarkable and, uh, and your leadership is inspiring, as I said before. And, uh, and we are very privileged to have you uh, uh, managing uh, uh, one of our two, our two hospitals. Um, we, we have a few questions. Um, one of the questions, and, and this is the time that if you have any questions to put, write them on the chat so we can relate to that. We have a few minutes to do that. Um, one of the questions here is how did the Minister of Health requirements uh, had an effect on the day-to-day -day operations of Mount Scopus? And I think this was evolving or devolving over time. So if you can refer to that. Yeah, that's actually, uh, whoever answered that question, thank you. You've touched on one of the biggest challenges of leadership in all of the hospitals in Israel, but specific, specifically in Hadassah Moor uh, during this situation. And this is why, because the Ministry of Health, and it's not my job to criticize or to compliment the, uh, the Ministry of Health, but the Ministry of Health were under a lot of pressure because they too, was suffering from the same uncertainty that we were all suffering from and had to make major, 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 major decisions. Now, the leadership of the Ministry of Health, of Health, which has since been replaced because there's finally a new government in Israel, took a certain stand. And this stand was the extreme stand, like preparing for the worst case scenario. Now, you probably always have to prepare for the worst case scenario, but I'm not sure you always have to take all the steps in order to go in that direction. But that's what happened. And you know, and, and 
and I'll probably maybe I can connect the Ministry of Health together with its best friend, the government's best friend, the media, because uh, um, I, I don't know what's happening, what's been happening around the world with the media, but the media enjoy this juice, the juicy news about COVID and the disastrous aspects of this breakout and so forth, and were not helping at all in helping the population calm down and try and put things into perspective. So the Ministry of Health on one side, and the media on the other side, and reality in the middle. And reality says, you know, we have to keep on treating the patients, not only the COVID-19 patients. And now I'll address the question. So the Ministry of Health quite quickly, very early, uh, sent out instructions to all the hospitals, um, stop doing any elective procedures. Any elective procedures must be stopped. Now, elective means the opposite of emergency, which means anything that you've made an appointment for is considered an elective. So that's fine if, for example, you want to have your nose fixed, right? That can definitely wait till after you have COVID. But what happens if there, you have a polyp on your uh, intestine, which might eventually become cancerous? What happens if your knee has been hurting for years and you finally got the appointment that, that, that might help you be able to get back to yourself? Okay, um, what happens, you know what, as a gynecologist, I'll tell you, what happens with all the ultrasounds that women do when they're pregnant to make sure the babies have no malformations? That's also an elective procedure. So when the Ministry of Health, because of, I'll allow myself to say, a little bit of panic came out with this instruction, all we could do was ask ourselves, can we really take responsibility for our patients if we stop all elective procedures? And the leadership, the leadership of Hadassah, said, no, we can't take responsibility and we are not going to stop anything that we think has even the slightest risk to a patient's life. So at the end of the day, we found ourselves um, not totally following the Ministry of Health instructions. Now, can we do that? Yes, we can. First of all, we can do that because at the end of the day, we're the ones responsible for patients and also because Hadassah is a, is a privately owned, right? HWZ away owned hospital. So we can allow ourselves to do these things. And generally, if I go back to things I believe in the leadership, I think that if you behave with integrity and you believe that you can uh, stand behind decisions that you make, even difficult decisions, then you're always in the right. Well, even if you're doing something different than what the regulator required you to do. So a few weeks after Hadassah kept on doing all, any elective procedure with any uh, any part, level of risk for the patient's life or health, then all other hospitals followed suit and started doing the same thing. Despite Hadassah's, the fact Hadassah kept on working and doing any of those elective procedures, the numbers dropped significantly because many patients chose not to undergo uh, the procedures. Um, if there were patients, you know, where really there was no risk, then I'm happy for them that they postponed. People were afraid of coming to hospitals. People were afraid or weren't really allowed to leave their homes, even though, of course, they could come to a hospital if they had to. But unfortunately, a lot of the patients postponed procedures which could, uh, in the long run, cause them damage. And, and I feel bad for those patients. And that was one of the reasons that we kept on advertising the fact that Mount Scopus is COVID free. You know, even in the last few days, I walked out of the hospital a couple of hours ago and the the corridors were a little bit empty again. And, and I spoke to one of my colleagues and they said, you know, the, the, the thing, because everyone's talking about, you know, is, is there a different wave? Is there, isn't there, you know, we, we, we go on about that for hours, right? Then people again um, are unfortunately choosing not to come to the hospital. So that's what, how we dealt with the Ministry of Health. Another thing that happened with the Ministry of Health, which was very, very significant, was that, as I said, mentioned before, Professor Rochstein, who's the, uh, the DG of uh, Hadassah, above us of both hospitals, he made the brave decision, right, to screen all the all Hadassah staff, like I mentioned before. But this was very much opposed to the Ministry of Health attitude, right? To begin with, the whole attitude was we don't screen people who are asymptomatic, anyone, only people who have a symptom. Eventually, the Ministry of Health is doing exactly what Hadassah did to begin with. And, and today I read that, uh, that um, that Israel reached a new peak of the number of tests a day, and they tested for 20,000 20, people, most of them being asymptomatic, obviously, which in my eyes explains one of the, uh, the main reason where we're, where we're supposedly inside the second wave because we're identifying uh, that many uh, patients who are asymptomatic. But that's how we address the issue of the Ministry of Health. 
I think you know you 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 touch one of the one of the roles that Adassa traditionally played and and played during this uh, this uh, crisis too, which is you know being a pioneer in uh, in innovation and sometimes that means challenging the 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 status quo of what's uh, what's the system provides as an answer and that might be controversial, but uh, uh, I think that uh, this is a period where the whole world has been learning to deal with something unknown. And in that sense, nobody could come and say, we know what's good and what's, uh, what, what's the right protocol to follow to deal with this. And in, in, this, in, this, in, uh, and in this respect, I think that uh, uh, Adassa took, uh, 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 took the role of you know, bringing some alternative uh, solutions that were implemented later by Mm -hmm. the, the entire country and uh, yeah. and not only by the entire country we can say i can say from the place where i am uh, working in, in connection with many other countries all over the world that been implemented by in many other countries following the example of adasa particularly in what concerns the the testing uh, policy uh, and uh, and some pooling techniques to and many of the things that were implemented by by Adasa, uh, one question, and I think with this we can we can come to, a cl to, to to some kind of like closing remarks. Also, it's a specific question, but I think it's a good case to to, to talk about uh, the role of uh, Adasa and Adasa in Max Corpus. Um, one of the uh, questions goes around Down syndrome uh, patients, and one of the flagships of Adasa in Max Corpus is the Center for uh, Children Chronic Diseases. That, uh, that treats uh, children with all kinds of different special needs in a very integrated and unique, uh, and unique way. And as we know, uh, this population has been one of the main challenges all over the world because you know, it's difficult to explain to a child with uh, special needs how to deal with the pandemic, how to keep distance you know, um, uh, for parents. And I, I speak from my personal experience for parents of autistic children, for example, it's very difficult to explain some of the things. It's not difficult to explain how to keep physical distance because they have that advantage that that's what they want. But how was the experience and is the experience of uh, having a center where children with special needs and with chronic diseases uh, have to come and it's part of their routine uh, in a period of, uh, of a pandemic like this? So though I, though I mentioned the fact that generally the numbers dropped of anything that's elective, um, the center where the numbers dropped less than anywhere else was in the Center for Chronic Diseases for Children. Happy so, to hear. Yeah, the families who bring their children over the years have such trust and such a close relationship with the staff that they came, most of the appointments were kept despite the situation. Now, um, very quickly, Hadassah organized, uh, organized um, online clinic, uh, clinical meetings, right, where, where physicians could meet the patients over the computer instead of them coming. So this happens sometimes. Telemedicine. <laughs> yeah, telemedicine, thank you. This happens sometimes also with the children and the, the staff took upon themselves the responsibility of contacting those patients whom they thought could that they could see over telemedicine and those who needed to come. I actually spoke a lot about this with uh, two people. One of them, Dr. Ariel Tenenbaum, who's the head of the unit of the children with chronic diseases, and he's also the head of the Down Syndrome Center, uh, who spoke to me about those children who come and mentioned that most of them kept on coming. And the second person whom I spoke to about, is, who I spoke uh, uh, to about this is Professor Yaakov Barkun. He's the head of pediatric department in Heart of Him, in Mount Scopus, and his speciality is rheumatological disease in children. So he, he injects steroids into children with chronic diseases, uh, joints, children who have chronic pain and so on. They come, whether it's weekly or monthly or whatever each of them needs for their appointments. And he told me that the numbers of the kids that came hardly dropped. And, and I think I could probably compliment the parents of these children who had their priorities right and, and realized that it was important to bring these children despite the situation. Uh, and I'm happy for them. I think they say, we are, the Talmud is written that the, uh, those who save one life is like they are saving humankind. Yeah. And I yeah. think, you know, I would say those who treat one patient properly in times of uncertainty is like they are treating 
the whole world. And I think that's the example we are taking from, from what you, you are doing and you've been doing uh, uh, running with so much compassion and care uh, at that Samount Scopus. We are, we are very proud um, that, you know, from the side of those of us here who are just supporting the activity of the hospital, um, that, uh, that, that we have you there with, with your team and caring so well for, for the people of Jerusalem and the people of Israel. So we want to thank you. Um, it's been, it's, it's been a, an amazing uh, experience to have you and to have this dialogue with you. And, uh, and we are here to, uh, to be with you from strength to strength in an ongoing basis. So thank you so thank much. You, thank you all of you who have connected to, to speak to, with me today. And, and thank you also to all those uh, people whom you represent around the world because we couldn't do what we do without all the positive energies that we get from all of you. So, so really, I want to thank you. We don't do this alone. Thank you. Have and before we, before, we leave, before we leave, give the applauses for one more minute. Uh, Jan from our team at the Dash International uh, has a couple of announcements regarding our ongoing activities with the Summer Summit and a couple of other things. So Jan, please. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Tama. Very interesting webinar. Uh, the next webinar is next Monday at 7 p.m. Israel, 12 p.m. Eastern Time and 5 p.m. GMT. Don't miss it. It's going to be with Dr. Abed Khalaila, who's the Director of the Kidney Transplantation Service at Hadassah, and Mrs. Rachel Heber, who's the head of the organization Matmat Chaim, it's going to be about the challenge of transplants during COVID-19. And I just want to remind you also about our uh, Hadassah Chong song challenge, uh, Let Us Be Healed, uh, was a song, is a song created by Israeli artists Yair Levy and Shai Sol. If you make your own version and adaptation of the song, the most original videos will win the chance to sing with the artist on Zoom and it will be shared internationally. You can find all the details in the chat right now. It's being posted and it's very exciting. So I hope we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, John, for the announcements and thank you everybody for participating on the second event of the Adas International Summer Summit. We hope to see you on Monday. It's going to be a very, uh, a very inspirational story besides all the, the, the knowledge that we will hear. Um, there is a personal connection between uh, Dr. Halaila and uh, the, the current president of the organization that works on transplants. Um, they, they both come from very different backgrounds and uh, uh, the late husband of, uh, of the president of this foundation was a patient of Dr. Halaila. Uh, and, and I invite you to hear that story and all the very interesting presentation and all the other events that you can see online uh, for the Summer Summit. Once again, thank you, Tamar, for participating in this event. Thank you, everybody. This is the moment when we unmute the, the mic so everybody can share your applauses and uh, thank yous and goodbyes to everybody. It's a pleasure yeah. to see you here. See you, everybody, on Monday. Bye.